get started. Let me see if I even have this thing turned on here. Hey, there we go. Thanks, Hunter. Um, uh, let's see here. I have one question before we pray. Okay, had time change last night. Now, depending on, depending on you as a family or individual, what time is last night varies person to person. Uh, for some people who are solar powered, last night could have been 8 o'clock when they, when they changed their clocks. Um, but here's the question. How many of you adjust your time to go to sleep based upon the time change? Or how many of you go to bed at the same time as always and just lose an hour's worth of sleep? Um, I was thinking about that at way too late o'clock when I was watching the West Coast College basketball games wrap up. And I was like, you know, this probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. But they were good games, and UCLA lost, so that made it a better game. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's open with prayer and we'll begin. Father, thank you for the day and for your goodness to us. We thank you so much for the many blessings that you give. Father, thank you for your word. God, what it reveals to us of you, what it shows us uh, as far as our walk in this world. Father, how it gives us comfort and joy. Father, admonition, uh, sometimes even rebuke. Thank you for your spirit that takes that word and makes it alive in our hearts. Father, thank you for the gift of your son who came and died in our place that we could have the forgiveness of sins. And Father, thank you for a God that we can trust in each and every season of life. God, I ask that you would take now, uh, use this time, help it to be beneficial and uh, profitable for us. Father, as we look into your word, help us to see things that we can use on a regular daily basis. Father, I pray you be with the other classes, the other aspects of the ministry of Cedar Hill. God, would you just uh, bless in a mighty way today, we ask in your name, amen. All right. Um, as you can see from the title slide, two things. First of all, 197. Um, keeping in mind that the... The 10 numbers, those divisible by 10, are always review lessons. Um, and so 197, that means after today there are two in this very long series, this four-year series that we've been in. And uh, even when I put the slides up on the screen, I was like, well, i got two more lessons in this thing. Um, which is a kind of an, uh, an interesting thought because this has been the focus of uh, my preparations for the last four years. Um, now, for a whole bunch of years prior to that, um, not the case. And coming soon to a auditorium near you, not the case. But uh, it was interesting thinking, when we started this and Pastor and I were talking about, hey, is this something that we'd be interested in? What do we think? I think four years is a long time. And it's not. Especially looking back. And when we stop and think of where we are in life, uh, time flies, doesn't it? You know, I joke so often that the hands on that clock don't stop. Um, neither do the pages on the calendar. And James said it so very, very clearly. For what is your life? It's here today and gone possibly today. It goes by fast. All right. Um, the prayer of the believers, which I thought was interesting because one of my, it, one of my favorite studies in the, in the New Testament epistles is the prayer for the believers. When we study the prayers of Paul particularly, as he prays for the believers in some of the different congregations, and he lists right out in the text, uh, here's what I'm praying for. And I thought that, that, that's a fascinating study to see what Paul wanted to see done in their lives. But today is not the prayer for, but the prayer of. Our prayers to God. Um, a passage that's, uh, I say it's not in the notes. It's not a, a header on one of the slides. I may have tucked it into one of the slides. This is where we'll start. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, we'll pick up there. We'll get there in just one moment. Um, the subnote here on this title slide says, Believers are called to... Pray without ceasing. Um, and people will joke about that regularly. Yeah, what about when you're driving? Do you close your eyes and bow your head? You know, we'll joke about stuff like that. But we joke about, hopefully because we understand the seriousness of the command. Uh, in each and every season of life, but each and every day, 
we ought to have a heart that's so close to God that we can commune to him with no trappings. Uh, just we're talking to our Heavenly Father. A um, question that we have here, does God hear everyone's prayers? Um, interesting question, one that uh, as soon as you see the question or hear the question, you probably have thoughts in your heart and mind right away in regards to the answer to that. Our verse, uh, I'm going to pass on the verse today, not to just skip it and whitewash it, otherwise I would have hidden the slide. Um, but there's a lot to cover here. Uh, just want to point out two things here. Uh, at the beginning, uh, John says, After this I beheld, lo, a great multitude no man could number. Uh, that's a lot of people. Okay, And look to the very end. Uh, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb. Our God is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Okay, This is where salvation begins and ends. And at the end of time, um, all mankind stands before him. They, they, uh, at that point, there's not much more they're going to be able to do. Uh, they're standing before the judge of mankind. We'll get to Philippians in just a moment. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 16. Uh, Hebrews 4, 16 is a verse, it's one of my, one of my uh, favorite verses within the scripture. It's an interesting verse when we think about uh, what the writer is saying here. We, I think we looked at it, not in detail, but looked at it just a couple of weeks ago when we were in the book of Hebrews. I like this. Let us therefore come boldly. Now think about that for a moment. We are talking to God. It does not say presumptuously, doesn't say come with great expectation, although we can have those expectations. It doesn't say we come argumentatively, although look at Abraham when God says he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't argue with God, but he reasoned with God. You're going to destroy, what if there's 50 righteous people? And he worked it down to 10. He, he sat and he... Uh, in our mind, I think he bargained, and that's not really the term, but that that's, helps us to get an idea of what's happening here. Abraham was passionate and wanted God to spare this. He came to God, and he had boldness talking to God. Now, when you look at the wording that's there, it wasn't as if he said, God, you have to do this. He's going, would you save the city if there's this many righteous people here? Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. And think about that. We're, that that's where we're going. Uh, we just saw this, this God sits on the throne. Uh, and why? That we may obtain great riches and honor and get a name to ourselves. Uh, no, that we may do what? We may obtain, what's it say? Mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Paul, praying to God, God, would you remove this thorn in the flesh? And God says, no, but I will give you grace. And that is so very, very important. Turn over to Philippians then, our starting point. Philippians 4, um, familiar passage. So much of Philippians is uh, familiar to us. Um, chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Um, we have that verse, I can do all things. Here we have... Paul writing, talking about some different aspects of life, that ought, uh, different aspects that ought to be present in the life of the believer. Um, just a couple notes here, first of all. Uh, this is written to the church in Philippi, obviously, hence the name. It wasn't written to a man named Philip, it was written to a group of people from a city named after Philip. Um, it was written to this church here. And it offers instruction on various topics. Uh, it's not quite like Proverbs where the various topic could be one verse and you've got 31 chapters within the verse and they all 31 deal with different things. It's not like that. But it does talk about different aspects of the life of the believer. Um, in some cases, uh, different aspects in regards to the pending death of the believer. Paul says, I'm in a straight betwixt two. Am I going to go or, do I wanna, or should I stay? You know what? God still has a work for me. It would be better for me to stay. And so it's different aspects, different things that we have to deal with. Um, the, this final section of the book has a, a number of short statements. Some of them commands, not all of them, but some of them commands, uh, some of them questions, some of them 
uh, if you want to say personal greeting, hey, uh, tell this person over here I said hello, things like that. There's, there's a lot tucked in here. Um, let's look at uh, these few verses here, four through seven. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Um, we'll go ahead and read the next verse. It's not on here, but uh, you can't go into this passage without reading verse 8, can you? I think, I think that's just wrong. Uh, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things those things that we ought set our mind to as believers. We have these short commands, these short statements here. Uh, the couple within this particular uh, couple of verses, uh, rejoice. Not just rejoice and call it a day. What did he say? Uh, rejoice in the Lord all the way. And just in case you forgot what I said four words ago, rejoice. Uh, makes it pretty clear. Uh, let your moderation or your self-control, let your behavior be known. Um, just a couple of, uh, uh, last week, week before, we mentioned uh, Philemon, and one of the notes on the slide there was that his reputation, his character was, was known. People saw him, they knew him, they recognized him, they knew about him. People see us, and they evaluate us. And Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, and he tells these believers, when they see you, when they evaluate you, let them see this. Let them see your moderation. Um, verse 6, uh, be careful or anxious for nothing. Think about that for a moment. And we, we understand this. Uh, what are the things in life that are in front of you that you're not really sure you want to go through? Uh, we encounter those on a fairly regular basis. Some big, some small. Sometimes we see the mountain in front of us. Sometimes we see the molehill and it looks like a mountain. Sometimes we see the molehill and we turn it into a mountain. But what are the things that we, I'm not worried, I'm just very concerned. What are the things that we get really concerned about? And Paul writes to these believers here, in a historical time period when their life could have been turned upside down pretty quickly, Paul writes to them and says, be careful, be anxious for nothing. Well, how am I going to solve this problem? Oh, he didn't stop there. But in everything, take it to God. Take it to God. And that's the next point then. Be careful for nothing. Talk to the Father. Um, I want to say get him involved, but the fact is he's already involved. It's just a question of whether we listen to him, whether we, we pay attention. So as we are talking to the Father, as we're praying, um, we need to come to God aware of his ability to provide. This is the same passage, um, often misused, but look at verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need. He just finished talking about the generosity of the Philippian believers as they gave to others, to Paul and to others. He says, you've been generous helping to meet the needs of others, my God will supply your need. Why could he say that? Because he was fully aware of God's ability to provide. Um, old Sunday school chorus. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. It's his. Um, it's interesting how over the over years the title of richest man of the world passes from person to person. Um, Elon Musk at the moment was Bill Gates for quite a while, was the Mexican dude, I can never remember his last name. His first name is Slim. I don't, he, I don't remember what his last name is. Uh, but it was him for uh, a handful of years, maybe four, five, six. Um, the, you know, I don't care how much money they have. Their wealth isn't going to compare with God's. And God could buy their wealth and leave them with nothing overnight. Um, the rich fool in the, uh, in the Gospels, 
Look at all this great harvest I have. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger. And God says, thou fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. You cannot buy your safety or salvation. And so we need to come to God understanding that he is the one who can provide. And because he can provide, as we come to him in prayer, we shouldn't be anxious. Let us therefore come boldly. Again, not demanding, God, you owe me. Uh, no, not hardly. But we can come to God boldly. That idea of anxiousness or anxiety, it's a lack of trust in God in our present situation. Or perhaps in that situation that's right around the corner. Um, and so we talk to him. Uh, what is prayer? Prayer, quite simply, is... Um, John R. Rice had the book, uh, prayer, asking and receiving. I'm taught, but it's not always asking, God, would you please give me great, great riches? God, uh, sometimes it's, God, would you please give me my daily bread? Um, and when you think about that statement, that term daily bread, think back, he's talking to the Jews who fully understood the idea of manna that they'd been taught for years and years and years, They'd heard the stories of their forefathers walking through the wilderness, and that bread they picked up was good for one day, except the Sabbath was good for one day, and one day only. They understood the concept of daily bread. Uh, they did not have refrigeration in this age. Uh, they did not have all of the great preservatives that we do today, or not so great preservatives that we do today. You think, you think all the preservative, preservative, preservatives that we eat, if my mouth will work, all the preservatives that we eat, you think we'd be living to 200 now. Um, think about it. I've got to trust God, not only with the future, but with the day, where I am. Um, so our communication with him is simply prayer and supplication. Prayer, the idea is my general petitions. Whereas supplication, that's when I'm pleading to him about very specific requests. I'm talking to him and saying, God, I have a need. No, the need may be mine, maybe somebody else's. Maybe you're praying for a friend or a loved one who has a very specific, but you're going to God with very specific requests. God, sometimes, maybe something God, would you bless such and such a missionary as they minister and serve over in whatever country? Sometimes you're saying, God, would you help such and such a missionary with this very specific need that he has as he's trying to serve you, and he, this is what he wants to see accomplished. Sometimes it's general, sometimes it's specific. But I go to him with both prayer and supplication. And this communication with God has to include thanksgiving. Think about all that he has done for us. I mean, we hear it in November every year. Thanksgiving needs to be more than one day a year. Well, when I'm talking to God, my thankful heart should be more than simply once in a while. What has he done for us? We don't think about it. We go about our life because everything we do is normal unless it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. But how many of us arrived in church safely today? Even with all the maniacs on the highway. Um, even with the propensity of man-made vehicles to break down just when you least need them to do so. I mean, when you think about it, there are so many things that we take for granted day after day after day. We need to have a heart full of thanksgiving. Well, when we're praying, these requests need to be made to the Father. Who am I talking to? I am talking to, as we saw in our verse from Revelation, that just pointed out a couple of things. All mankind is standing before the God of the universe. Wow. This is not simply, simply, this is not simply the governor or the president. This is not somebody who had great power such as the Roman emperor who, covered, who you know, ruled over the majority of the known world at that time. No, no, we're talking about the God who made all things. We're, we're, we're praying to the Father. And as we're praying, we are... We're understanding that it's through this trusting prayer that we find peace as we look back at our verse. Okay, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. What's the very next verse say? And the peace of God, 
that passeth all understanding. When I pray with a trusting heart, knowing that my God has the ability to provide and protect, I can have peace because I know I don't have to figure this out. That doesn't mean I sit down and just live an apathetic life and don't really care about what happens. But I understand it's not my job to micromanage my life. I have to understand that God is in control. Um, still in verse 7, uh, we're praying to God. We have this peace that comes uh, from God through prayer. Shall keep your hearts and minds. Um, first of all, that peace is beyond our understanding, and we're kept in Christ. The idea is that he watches over us. Uh, depending upon where you're reading and what you're studying or whatever, when you go back to read the, uh, the histories of the, the uh, early days of the country, um, as they're established, you'll hear a lot of folks, well, a lot of these early, these early Americans, they were deists. They, they, they believed in a God who just, uh, he well in the clock and then sat up there and just watched it spin. Uh, no, he's actively interested in us. He keeps us, that he, he keeps watch over us. He does, again, he doesn't move us when I do wrong. Adam and Eve took of that tree. God could have slapped their hand when they reached for it but did not. He gave us a free will. I can make good choices. I can also make bad choices. But he knows every choice. He sees, he keeps watch over us. He's concerned for us. And then we look in John chapter 10 and we find the good shepherd. And what does it tell? We're in his hand. As he's keeping watch over us, we're right here. We are literally within arm's reach. God has very long arms. He can call all men unto himself. But we're, we are right here. And so he is very, very concerned over us because it's Jesus Christ who keeps watch over the, over the believers. Think about that. Think about the price that he paid for us. Do you think he's interested in, uh, using a modern term, his return on investment? I mean, think about it for a moment. If I go Christmas season, you're walking into whatever store and you have the Salvation Army bell ringers and you throw your standard 50 cents or a buck in the, in the bucket. You throw a buck in the bucket, what are the chances you're going to go home and track their spending to make sure that they're spending their money wisely? You give somebody $1,000, you're a little bit more interested, Right? Maybe you are independently wealthy, and so when it comes time for your charitable giving, you find a charity that you can get after, and you give them $100,000. Do you think you might look at their financial reports and see how your money is being spent? What kind of price did Christ pay for us? Do you think he might be interested? He's very concerned. He keeps watch over us. When we pray... We pray with trust in God. And when that happens, when I know that God, who created all things, when I understand that he's in control, peace replaces worry. Be anxious for nothing. Now, we're still human, right? Last time I checked. Um, and I might do a really good job of trusting until I get the next phone call. I might do a really good job of trusting until I see the next headline. And what I start the process over again. I go back to him in prayer. I talk to the Father to see, to let him know, here's my concern. I could be general petition. It could be specific petition. But I understand that he is the one that's in charge. Same author, different book. Go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, right at the end of the book. Again, just like uh, in Philippians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we find kind of the same idea. A number of short statements. 1 Thessalonians 5, just a couple of verses. In this case, we will just look at 3. Rejoice evermore, verse 16. 17, pray without ceasing. 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The short statement commands don't stop right there, but for time we'll just look at those. 
uh, verse 16, pray without ceasing. Again, we mentioned uh, pray always. Okay, what do I do? Close my eyes and bow my head when I'm driving? No, but my heart should always be in a place where I can regularly commune with the Father. I can talk to him about anything at any time. Well, why would we do that? Because this is God's will. God wants us to pray. And it tells us very clearly in verse 18 that giving thanks is the will of God. But we can see it's God's will because what does the command say? Pray without ceasing. And notice the, uh, the similarity when we think of what we just saw in Philippians chapter 4. Told us to rejoice, told us to pray, told us to pray with thanksgiving. And we find those same things mentioned right here. Um, and the terms evermore or without ceasing, each and every circumstance in life. What is it that causes us to go to God? What is, this that, what is it that we pray about, that we talk to the Father about? Simple answer should be everything. Have you, have, have you ever had a friend that you could talk to about anything? And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. This friend should be somebody that we can go to each and every day, multiple times, and talk to them about everything that we're facing. There is a, there's an across, I'd seen it before, uh, maybe you've had it mentioned in a Sunday school lesson in personal devotions in a, uh, in a message in church. Uh, it's an acrostic to ad assist with prayer. And I think that's the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think there's an application statement, but we're not done with verses. This, this lesson is a little bit different. It tucks the, this uh, acrostic in here. Uh, and the acrostic spells acts. Acts. A-C-T-S. Uh, A is for Adoration. Basically, we worship and adore our God. If you want to get a verse down, it's uh, Psalm 146, 1 through 2. Um, for time, um, I don't care, time change or not, that clock does not slow down. Um, does God know? Well, even look at the model prayer. As Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray, it begins with what? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be that. It's, it's, it's pointing to the fact that this is the great and the mighty God that, we're, that we are praying to. We worship and adore him. I mean, I think for just a moment, the, the character traits of God and how those character traits are used by the Father directed toward us and how they help us. Again, with what we're talking about today. I don't know what's around the next corner in life. We can't see around corners. I don't know what's around the bend. God does. So as I pray, I can talk to the one who knows the beginning from the end, who knows what I'm going through, but he also knows what I will go through. Um, that's kind of comforting. And as I pray, I can show adoration. I can show worship and thanks to him for all that he's done. Uh, C is confession. To humbly ask for forgiveness. Uh, 1 John 1, 9. What other verse did you think we were going to go to, right? First uh, John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to, he's going he's to do something about it. If I confess, he's going to forgive. T, you see we have adoration, we have confession, T is thanksgiving. To be aware of God's blessings, but to be thankful for God's blessing. We're not going to be thankful if we're not aware, but just because we're aware doesn't mean we have gratitude. Both are, are necessary. Uh, have you ever bought a, a gift for somebody and hid it away so they wouldn't find it and then forgot where you put it? Or maybe you didn't forget where you put it, but you forgot to get it out and give it to them on time. If they weren't, to, if they weren't aware that you had it, were they thankful for it? No, they didn't know it was there. Have you ever given somebody a present and they expressed no thanks and gratitude? Maybe they were aware of the present, but they didn't have a heart of, a heart of thanks. Both awareness and thanksgiving are necessary. God wants us to know what he's done for us. God wants us to be thankful for what he's done for us. Uh, and then S, supplication. Uh, we just talked, mentioned that. That's when we take our specific request. We go to God and we take our needs and the needs of others. Intercessory prayer, big part of the prayer of the believer. Uh, take our needs and those of others to the Father. 
Why? Because my God shall supply all your needs. I'm going to... Have you ever... And it could have been a missionary coming in. It could have been uh, you were made aware that somebody had a need. And you wanted to meet the need, but you honestly did not have the wherewithal to do that. I know somebody who does. And I can go to the Father and ask Him on their behalf for those needs to be met. Um, that's part of what we do with missions giving, but honestly, that's a small plan, a small piece of the plan of God. It's an important piece. <clears throat> Let's wax political for a moment, why not? Um, if the church had done its job over the last 200 years, social welfare programs would be unnecessary. You read in the scriptures, God doesn't tell the government to meet the needs of the people. Who's supposed to? If the church had done, well, how does that happen? God, they've got a need. I want to help, but my help is not enough. Would you be a part of this? How does that happen? When I go to the Father, and what do I go to the Father to do? I show him that I am grateful and thankful that I understand that he is the mighty God. I worship him. Not that I'm singing in my prayer, but there's no reason I can't. But I am worship. I am adoring the Father, understanding who He is and all that He has done for me. I confess my sins, knowing that when I confess, it's, it's, it's a very simple math equation. One plus one equals two. I don't care how you slice it. If I go to the Father, if I confess my sins, He is faithful and just to forgive me my sins. And when He forgives my sins, I am cleansed of all unrighteousness. I go to Him with thanksgiving. I am aware, but, yeah, but I go through life, and I don't think about, did you ask him to open your eyes? God, help me to see the blessings you send my way. Do you think he might like that because he knows what the end result is, is you see what he's done? And then I go to him with these needs and ask him to help meet those needs. All right, go to Psalm 145. We are going to run out of time, so we will move as quickly as we possibly can here, or as quickly as we do. Um, 145. Turned here. I will extol thee, my God, O my King. I will bless thy name forever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Can you see the psalmist expressing his adoration to the Father? Um, the Lord is great, verse 8, the Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all. What's he doing? He is showing, he is ex expressing his adoration to the Father, uh, talking about the blessings of God for all that he has done, um, talking about the righteousness of God, his grace, mercy, and compassion, talking about his goodness to all. It's an interesting statement. Don't have time to elaborate on that, but uh, what does the word all mean? And that, that idea that we can go to God to tell him how we adore him, how we appreciate his attributes. First John chapter 1. C was for confession. First John chapter 1. And looking at the... Uh, last few verses within this short chapter. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, think about it. If we confess, well, I don't have anything to confess, and John wraps up this chapter, keeping in mind it wasn't a chapter division then. I don't have anything to confess. And if we say that we don't have anything to confess, we're lying. So let's go back to, you ever uh, seen those, kind of like a flow chart? Um, step one, which direction are you going to go? Step two, if you went to the uh, B, go back to step one. 
Uh, and that's what this is. If we say that we have nothing to confess, guess what? We're lying. Go back and confess your lie now. Confession. Uh, we're deceiving ourselves and calling God a liar, saying that and we are being liars if we deny that we've sinned. Well, where does it say we're calling God a liar? Well, look at verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Why? Because he said, for all have sinned and come... Oh, what does all mean? Uh, with true confession comes forgiveness. It's not simply a case, God, forgive me, I think I may have done something wrong yesterday. Now, with true confession, that I come to an agreement with him that what I did was wrong, that it was sin. Now, I like this. We can be cleansed. We know that we've done wrong. We're stained, we're marred, we're scarred. Guess God can never use me if I confess my sins. He's faithful and just to forgive me. Well, I like this. God is just. Now, think about that. What does the word just mean? In this case... And this usage here is that legal term. He's just, he's holy. A holy God, and we've heard it before, right? A holy God cannot have sin in his presence. But a just God understands that the price for that sin has been paid. So if I for, ask for forgiveness, he's ready to forgive that sin. Christ has paid the penalty. Um, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2. Just uh, one verse and one statement from the verse. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us, causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Thanksgiving, Paul is thankful for the fact that there's triumph through the gospel. The gospel is going to march forward and man for years has tried to fight against it and the gospel always wins. And Paul is grateful for that. He's grateful for the fact that he can trust in a God whose plan will always come to fruition. Um, let's see here. I'm going to pass over the next couple slides. Uh, if you want to write down references, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, but 2 Corinthians 8.16, uh, Paul is thankful here. He's thankful for uh, Titus' love for the Corinthian believers. Um, in Ephesians 5.20, Paul is showing thanks. Uh, thanks be unto God for all things. Um, in Matthew 9, uh, Matthew 6, let's go there, go to supplication. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Supplication. Going to God with our requests. Um, after this manner, we have the model prayer here. After this manner, uh, therefore pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our, our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in tempt into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, He's got some requests that he's bringing to the Father. He asks for God's will to be done, which is interesting. He's asking that God's will be done, but guess what's going to happen whether he asks or not? God's will is going to be accomplished. But God wants us to get involved in the program. He asks here for his daily bread. He asked that his normal, routine needs be met. What are the things that we don't usually pray for? The normal, routine things, because they're there every day. We do the same thing all the time. Now, I am very guilty of this. We go on vacation. Before we pull out of the driveway, or as we're pulling out of the driveway, okay, let's pray that God will give us safety on this trip. I drive with just as many idiots on the 15-minute drive to work every day. Right? But yet, guess what we don't usually do? We don't usually pray for the 15-minute drive to work because we do that every day. It's that long 500-mile trip that we have to be worried. No. Most people in car accidents are killed within 20 miles of home. Maybe I need to be praying for those, too. We need to be asking God for our daily bread. And he asks here, and this is, this is, I love this, 
Lead us not into, into temptation. God, would you protect us? Protect us from sin. Uh, next, this is another of the uh, supplication uh, passages here. Uh, just for time, we're going to dive right into the application questions here. As we look at prayer in the scriptures, what aspects are most helpful to us, or what do we see? And I don't know that there's anything. This, again, uh, was it last week, week before? This was a refresher course. Uh, this was last week with John. Uh, John, as he writes, a new, uh, no new commandment I give I unto you. It's an old commandment. Then two verses later, a new commandment I give unto you. Well, wait a minute, which is it? Well, you know what, I think you forgot it, so it's new to you today, but it wasn't new yesterday when I told you about it. Um, when we look into the Scripture, there may be things that we've heard this before. Um, and so I can't necessarily fill in those blanks. But there are some things here that are significant. How about the importance of prayer? Regular daily prayer for regular daily needs. Um, the fact that God is interested in our prayers He's keeping watch over us. He sent his son to die for us. He doesn't want us to just flounder in this world. He wants us to live the victorious Christian life. Well, how does that happen? When I am in close communion with him. And then understand that there are different aspects of prayer. It's not just God meet my need. God, thank you for being you. Well, what is you? He is holy. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is transcendent. He is above all and over all. I mean, when you think, think about the different character, character traits of God, what makes him who he is? Different aspects in prayer. Uh, what is it about prayer that makes it difficult for us to be diligently committed to it? Well, boy, I wish we could solve this one, right? Oh, we speak to God, but we do not hear an audible response. Is that, is that an issue with, with life sometimes? We go to God in prayer, and it's not like he dials us up on the phone to answer that. Uh, sometimes the response doesn't come when or as we expect. We ask God to meet a need, and we know how that need should be met. And God says, you don't know anything. This is how that need should be met. Well, God, why would you do that? So that he can be glorified. Why was this man born blind? Who sinned? Him as No, he was born blind that the Father might be glorified. God had a completely different plan. Uh, sometimes, uh, back in, in education, when you have uh, goals and objectives for your class, what do you want to accomplish? The, one of the uh, first things you learn is that uh, your, your terms need to be measurable. I want all my students to do well. How do you measure that? Okay, I want all my students to successfully learn how to write a paper. Okay, now I can measure this. When we talk to God, sometimes the answers are not measurable. And so we kind of, oh, whatever. Uh, are there any habits in our prayer life or in groups that we pray with that uh, may, uh, may seem contrived or superstitious? Um, talking about the, the believer's prayer. Um, and what, one of the things that's talking, there are, there are people, God bless them, there are people who think that if you don't finish your prayer with in Jesus' name that you haven't successfully prayed. When I read the, Paul's prayer for the believers, guess what I don't see? I don't see him wrapping up with, in Jesus' name. There are things that we can't go to the, you know, you know how we can go to the Father? God, would you help me today as I do this? And I appreciate the fact, the knowledge that you're going to accomplish your will. And you might be walking through the halls on the way to your desk at work. Do we really think about what we're saying? Sometimes we just say the same things we've always said. And do we think that there's that specific formula to get answers for our prayers? Um, the Acts model that uh, we've had up on the slide. I just, one or two points on this I want to I mention. Let me get them all up on the screen here. Uh, aspects of, uh, the one thing I want to point out, uh, the benefit of having a model is it may keep our minds from wandering. Have you ever... God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, God, I'm going to talk to you for five to, maybe say, say, doesn't sound like much, but five minutes of, of consistent prayer seems like, what, 35, 40 minutes? Then you look at your watch and realize, <laughs> oh boy. One of the issues, our minds tend to wander. 
we think about all the different things that are going on. What do I have to get done today? Here, in this world that we live in today, you're talking to God, you're praying, and your phone beeps. Excuse me, God, because I've got to know who just texted me, right? I mean, think about the things that get in the way. So if I've got this, this road map, it helps to keep me focused. Um, uh, many skeptics uh, mock the idea of prayer as talking to an invisible man in the sky. If you're faced with that, what would you say? What would you do? Uh, first of all, understand there will always be skeptics. They're not going anywhere. Um, but understand that even Jesus prayed to the Father. The very Son of God talked to the Father. Um, all we're doing, we're simply obeying the directive to pray. My, I'm not changing the world. I'm talking to the one who can. All I'm doing is doing what I was told. But always respond to the skeptics with gracious biblical answers. Sometimes we, uh, sometimes they're snotty, so we want to be snotty in return, right? And what does it accomplish? Gracious biblical answers. The believer's prayer. Different things, not an exhaustive study, but different things that may help us as we go to the Father in prayer. God, would you guide in all that we do? Help us to take the lesson that we have today, Father, to look for ways that we can use it and apply it on a regular daily basis. Father, I pray that you would help us to be even more effective in our prayer life. Father, to look for ways to grow in our knowledge and understanding of who you are. God, that as we do, would help us to have a greater desire to commune with you, to fellowship with you. Father, I ask you to be with the service to come that you be with pastor, give him the words to say. Help us to have hearts and minds that uh, eagerly anticipate uh, the message. Father, looking for ways that we can take the principles contained therein and apply them to our lives. And we ask this in your name, amen. Hey, have a great day.